So I'd like to introduce my friend, Dr. Sam Rabar. He's the only integrative gastroenterologist in the LA area. His office is in Century City, and he combines conventional gastroenterology in the sense that he does um, colonoscopies and endoscopies in Heidelberg, uh, pH testing, but he also incorporates anti-aging and functional medicine approaches. He also offers SIBO breath testing out of his office. And if you do the SIBO breath testing through his office, he'll uh, personally interpret it with you. And he's a, a great clinician to work with uh, on patients. And uh, he lectures around the world, including at the upcoming SIBOCon conference in San Diego, Dr. Sam Rivar. Thank you, Ben. Uh, the subject uh, may be quite common for you, you might have worked with it, but I wanted to uh, share with you at least what is our experience uh, in managing patients who come to us because they don't want to be on a PPI, they don't want to be an acid reducer. But you must know the extent of the uh, uh, ailments to see how best we can uh, treat them and what mechanisms are involved in, uh, in the process. Uh, um, now, as far as the terminology, gastroesophageal reflux disease is what is used in the uh, classical textbooks. But uh, I don't know if Ben made this by mistake, but he called it disorders. And this fell in love with that, because I thought it was even better, because it's really not one disease, it's really a variety of disorders that relate to this. Do you do it by purpose or by <laughs> okay, Disorder is probably even better. Um, anyhow, would you be able to advance this, please? Uh, Yes. Um. Okay, if you can just go through the first few slides. Uh, uh, Mike Erdman is not here. He helped us prepare this set. And again, I wanted to talk about the definition, mechanism of illness, symptoms, complications, and also uh, some traditional models and see how this would integrate with the uh, 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 holistic model when we come to manage it. You really need both uh, you know, arms of the uh, um, uh, treatment models available depending upon where you stand with the patient. Uh, the next one, please. Uh, so by definition, this is a motility disorder and is characterized by heartburn and by reflux of the contents uh, into the esophagus. Uh, please, uh, next one, please. Thank you. And uh, there are some mechanisms that uh, uh, they call them like barrier functions and it relates to the esophagus, to the stomach, to the gastroesophageal junction. And it's a balance between what causes to come up and what keeps it in, uh, in place to prevent this process. And we need to know those mechanisms and we can support the physiological uh, uh, process to be able to prevent it. Yeah. Dr. Uh, Morris, could you stand closer to the screen? Thank you. Uh, during the endoscopy, there may be no visible uh, lesions, or there may be uh, esophagitis, uh, there may be peptic strictures and barrets. Uh, obviously, these are complications. Barrets happen quite early in the course of the illness. Either the patient has it or they don't. So usually, when you do the first time endoscopy, is there. If you don't see it the first time, I've never seen a barrets developing over time. So apparently, it happens very, very early in the course of the illness. Uh, and uh, you know, reading the textbook, they said they have probably more than 10 million visits for the rib frogs, but you already know that. Uh, yeah. So Barrett's is the precancerous situation, right? Yes, Barrett's is uh, the, uh, basically the creep up of the lining of the stomach into the esophagus. It really comes up apparently to protect the esophagus uh, from the acid, but uh, that piece that comes up is precancerous. Mm -hmm. okay, and it can go through dysplasia. It could be definite for dysplasia, indefinite, and eventually can lead to cancer. So when there's barriers, obviously there should be a mechanism for monitoring, you know, after that, okay. Um, just for information, if you're interested, barriers come on uh, 10 times more in men than women, and between age 40 and 60, Caucasian male is the most uh, prominent uh, scenario, and it's generally associated with other inflammation markers like uh, abdominal obesity and uh, you know the whole inflammatory process if you will okay. if there's no barriers is there still a possible risk of cancer with chronic reflux 
No, you need some sort of barriers. I mean, you may have other types of esophageal cancer, uh, but uh, generally for the uh, adenocarcinoma to develop, you need to have intestinal metaplasia, dysplasia, and if it's long enough, they do call it the Barrett's uh, um, So let's look at the pathogenesis of this. On the defense side, you have anti-reflux barriers, then you have esophageal acid clearance, and you have tissue resistance. And we're going to use each of these uh, uh, parameters uh, to, uh, uh, to support the recovery. Um, aggravating factors are stomach acidity, stomach volume, uh, and do you know content, like somebody who may have wide reflux, the stomach volume would be somebody who may be eating too much, too late, too fast, they, they contribute to the valve malfunction. So just have an overview of what is written here, then we'll come back and use some examples of here. Next one, please. The, uh, the area of lower esophageal sphincter, which is between the stomach and the esophagus, is very complex, okay? And as of today, I'm still learning how the anatomy of this area works. Uh, so the LES or lower esophageal sphincter, whenever I speak to my patients, I always tell them, you know, if you're a female, this is like your best, this is your, like your child born, that will take care of it. Okay? It's like a baby just came out of the tummy, you have to be very careful after that. And to the guys, I tell them this is like your best girlfriend, you got to take care of it, otherwise this lab is going to give you some trouble. <laughs> so, uh, and then most of the time they remember that and they're going to try to relate to uh, the Lord's Office Sphincter. So this muscle band, which is like a, you know, like a rubber band, you know, responds to human emotions, what we eat, how we eat, what time we eat, what's the composition of the food. And so there are a variety of receptors that uh, manipulate uh, uh, this valve. And if it starts to malfunction, we're going to get uh, problems with the reflux. So it's very, very important to know how it functions and how we can support that. Um, was there anything else on that one? Go back. Thank you. <laughs> then you have the diaphragmatic crura, the intra abdominal location of the valve, and the uh, um, phrenoesophageal ligaments and the angle of his. All of these things are anatomically important. The next picture is actually will show it to you, so you can relate to it. You go to the next page. So uh, here you can see, uh, you see the valve area, uh, half of it is down here, half of it is above, and uh, this is the diaphragm is actually putting additional pressure on the valve, and this is the ligament uh, that was talking. So this whole thing is necessary to be able to keep this uh, uh, valve in, uh, in excellent shape and prevent the reflux. Uh, okay, and the next one, please. Uh, okay. And then the, this uh, elaborates on what we just talked about, the lower of the sphincter is about four centimeters, two centimeters above the diaphragm, and two centimeters is below the tip. And you really need very small amount of pressure uh, to be able to um, prevent the reflux. Maybe five to 10 millimeters of mercury is enough to, to keep the tone. Uh, so when there's reflux, a lot of things have gone wrong that patients start to have symptoms or complications there. Um, if there's a hiatus hernia, obviously all those ligaments, they get uh, stretched and ripped, so you don't have the same uh, anatomical uh, integrity, if you will. Yeah. Next one, please. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and this uh, again talks about the, the same concept we talked about that the, the sphincter tone is about 10 to 30 millimeters of uh, mercury, but you really need about 5 to 10 to be able to prevent the reflux process. Okay. Um, okay. We'll get to the next one, please. Okay. So, looking at uh, some of the foods that would actually uh, make the uh, nose of the sphincter to relax. Um, like apparently if we eat the protein meal, it actually increases the baby because of the stimulation of gastrin, okay. Uh, but then you, the rest of it, you know, the chocolate, saturated fats, peppermint, carbonated beverages, food preservatives, anything that goes into a box, they're, too, they're very acidic, okay, and they tend to affect the bowel function. Uh, processed foods, green tea is to me is a huge uh, relaxer of the bowel, okay, so you can go to a restaurant and have a uh, heavy duty uh, green tea, you know, sitting uh, tea bag sitting uh, in the cup, and uh, it may initiate a reflux process, okay. And then it comes to dietary habits. Uh, 
Now, diet pain habits, we should talk about it. You know, I always tell to the other patients, uh, eating fast is a problem, uh, eating late is a problem, and the two hours before going to bed is really what I call a no man's land. So the analogy of that would be to reach Chris California where the U.S. Army has a, uh, a place that so you're not supposed to be there. And even drinking water or uh, taking supplements before bedtime is not advisable because you will be at the mercy of the valve to be able to maintain its in in integrity. If the contents come up during the night, they can rub the valve. And the analogy of that would be like a toothbrush that if you keep rubbing for one minute, it's okay, but if you rub for a few hours, the next morning the gum could be swollen and the mouth may have difficulty closing. So you can actually create a vicious cycle if you don't follow this rule of a no man's land that two to three hours before sleep time in okay. Peppermint is really surprising. Peppermint is good for irritable bowel syndrome, but uh, it does uh, relax the rose of just bacteria. Yeah, and terracotta peppermint oil has been found to be yeah, really helpful for IBS. I know, but it's not good for, <laughs> not good for this. So we, know, we need to know what we're treating here. What, okay. what, about, what about taking a Synthroid breast for bed? I mean, a pill with a little a sip of water is probably not a problem. You know, people take melatonin. There is even one article saying that melatonin is good for reflux. Uh, you know, I've never personally found it that helpful, uh, but uh, uh, it has been described. So I don't have a problem with that. But I've had patients who took fish oil before going to bed. Yeah. I mean, that's a long, that's a long chain fatty acid. It's going to relax the bowel for hours, and it's going to be a setup. Uh, for reflux. Also, if somebody has a sleep apnea, they have a snoring, you're going to create a lot of negative pressure in the chest, and that adds to the process of the reflux. Okay. What about lantus? What's that? Lantus for diabetes. The a lot of people take no. theirs before bed, a lot of my patients. It's Insulin? Yeah. Insulin. I'm not aware of that being a problem. Okay. okay. No. Uh, if they eat before they go to bed, it would be a, a, a challenge. Um, so these are some of the drugs, again, in a holistic model, we don't uh, work with these drugs, but a patient may come in and they may be one of these drugs, and uh, of course, uh, um, you know, taking sometimes uh, Xanax or Ativan uh, before bedtime, they do relax the yellow up just going to okay. And the drugs that they increase uh, the lower up just sphincter pressure, um, I mean, anti-acids, I was kind of surprised to see this, but it was somehow in the textbook yet. Um, baclofen has got a lot of attention. I think you should know about it. And I tell you what the alternative would be in the uh, holistic model that you can use. And cisopride is uh, out of the market. Uh, Domperidone is not approved in the US. Uh, obviously, we don't use histamine as a treatment. Uh, and metoclopramide is short term. Is okay. Occasionally, I've had patients who really have very bad gear, and maybe for a week or two weeks, I was able to sneak in a little metoclopramide to help them get over that uh, difficulty. Uh, but we really have limited medications to treat this problem. So, um, depending upon um, uh, the lifestyle modification, it becomes crucial to be able to support the valve. You really don't have much medication to support the valve without having a complication in okay. the Next one, please. Okay, so let's look at some important basic concepts, and I'm gonna go over this quickly, but one by one. The overall gastric acid secretion is normal in patients with GERD. Now, you have heard many times, oh, take acid pill, or I took acid pill, I felt better. Now, I can tell you, be very, very cautious with that because unless you have done a high liver test and you know if the patient has low acid, uh, it may, may actually cause more harm. Mm -hmm. And recently, I had a, a patient whom I endoscoped and uh, he was taking some uh, betaine. Um, I thought maybe this would help uh, you know, get some relief. And he came with intractable nausea. And when we did an endoscopy, you know, and I had done another one six months prior to that, but uh, when we did this, uh, there was evidence of esophageal ulceration, mm -hmm. and there was active esophagitis there. So you gotta be very, very careful. A lot of patients who claim that they have low acid, they're really having bile reflux, and the bile is the one that is neutralizing it, 
the acidity. If somebody has true low acid, there is probably a component of vagal neuropathy, and you need to look for causes of vagal neuropathy. And among those, we have had, for example, six patients with Lyme disease that the markers turned out to be positive. So you need to know the clinical uh, picture and do the proper testing. So if there's no increase in acid, then what's the uh, rationale for PPIs? The PPIs, the rationale is because when the acid is in the esophagus and the pH is less than 4, it activates pepsin. And the pepsin is what causes the damage to the, uh, uh, the land. So by increasing the pH more than 4.5, it helps to inactivate the pepsin. That's the reason for the recovery. Okay. Um, and again, you don't really have an acid problem. Okay. The problem is a motility disorder. The problem is the valve. And that's why you need to know the physiology of the valve. And I said you have to know exactly what makes this valve to malfunction. Okay. The challenge is that if the malfunction has been going on for a while and you know, the refluxate has been coming on, it can, um, uh, it can damage the valve, it can cause a scarring, it can cause inflammation. And then it puts it again into a vicious cycle of creating more malfunction. You can get a stuff into it. And if somebody is overweight and they have a sleep apnea and they snore, then it continues to be a challenge. Um, acid and pepsin are the key ingredients of the gastric refluxate producing esophagitis. The degree of esophageal injury from non-erosive gear to barrett's esophagus parallels the increase in the frequency and duration of the acid reflux with a pH less than four. Okay. Uh, next one, please. Okay. Uh, Helicobacter is an interesting phenomenon because you might have heard that Helicobacter gastritis actually produces reduced acidity. You may get gastric atrophy, and patients who have Helicobacter are less prone to have acid reflux. Correct, except for one scenario that if Helicobacter involves the antrum it can actually produce increased gastric production and it can add to the reflux symptoms. Now this is very interesting because we never use antibiotics or anti-helicobacter pylori regimen for treatment for reflux, but there are instances that uh, uh, you may have uh, uh, this scenario. And these are usually people who have a picture of hyperacidity, the stomach feels very irritated, there are some gastritis symptoms, and or reflux symptoms, uh, but to get a relief, you need to very carefully look for H. pylori and maybe biopsy the antrum separately from the other parts of the stomach and see if you can document that phenomenon. And isn't it the case that a typical endoscopy is not going to look for H. pylori in the antrum, right? No, no, we, I mean, I do, and I'm sure other GI doctors do. You know, we generally biopsy the antrum and the body of the stomach separately. And nowadays, in cases where H. pylori may be difficult to diagnose, we do PCR of the gastric tissue. We have also been, been finding some of our H. pyloris when we did do dental aspirate. So even though I didn't biopsy this, but I was looking for something else, on do dental aspirate, we found H. pylori, which means it was probably floating around in the whole juice, and it got picked up by the high-tech technology. Uh, I'm convinced that the regular staining and the uh, uh, regular staining uh, uh, does not, and uh, breath testing for H. pylori uh, do not always pick up low grade H. pylori level. And some of the dyspeptic symptoms may indeed have this phenomenon. Okay. Um, next one, please. Okay. okay, the transient doors of the sphincter relaxation. This is the type of scenario where the sphincter actually has a good tone, it's not a relaxed valve. But um, it relaxes inappropriately. Indeed, the previous term for this was inappropriate relaxation of the lower of the sphincter. And it almost like the muscle fatigues and it just can't hold the tone long enough and it will let go. And if this happens, the refluxate that comes up does not easily get cleared by esophageal motility. So it can just come up and sit there and exposes the esophagus to the pepsin and to the uh, uh, acid. So the transient doors of the sphincter occurs independently of swallowing. They're not accompanied by esophageal peristalsis, that's a bad thing. And it can, the juice can sit there for more than 10 seconds, you know, which can add to the problem. 
Um, and it looks like it also has some effect on those diaphragmatic connections, uh, you know, where the, uh, the, the valve gets supported there. Uh, next one, please. Okay, this is a hiatus hernia and then some concept like hypotensive lowers of your sphincter. This is the area of the valve okay, where the pressure could be low. And here, I'm sure you're familiar with the hiatus hernia, uh, the piece of the stomach is now above the diaphragm. So the diaphragmatic crura is no longer in opposition with the valve and this is not getting the support of this one. So you have lost half of the power that was keeping the valve in good shape. Now there are patients who have hiatus hernia, but the valve is still doing a good job. So they don't get reflux. So the hiatus hernia does not always mean reflux, but it does increase the likelihood of getting a reflux problem. Okay. Next one, please. Okay. Now let's talk about salivary and esophageal gland secretion. Saliva is required for normal esophageal acid clearance. Well, from a holistic point of view, this is great, because now I can think about using a chewing gum after eating and create salivation to be able to constantly clear the esophagus. The stimulus for salivation appears to be the presence of the acid in the proximal esophagus. Um, the normal daily volume of saliva is about one liter, but uh, if you have bad reflux, it can even go higher. So in our practice, we commonly use a special form of gum to be able to create salivation. Okay. You never chew gum on an empty stomach, that's going to fool the body, it's going to create more problems. Okay. If you do find a company where they can make a gum without sugar, let's invest together. In that point, it's going to be a good thing. Yeah. But uh, without also... Sugar, without sugar alcohols. Yeah. Right, so I mean, either you have to go with natural sugar or uh, aspartame is out, obviously you don't want to do that. Uh, uh, so many times we use xylitol, the question if the patient has SIBO, I get a call from the nutritionist, you're not supposed to use <laughs> SIBO, just a little tiny bit of xylitol, you know. Okay, and many times you really know, don't need to chew on the gum, you just need the saliva, you can put the gum in the mouth and just play with it and allow the salivation to come. Uh, and I find is that at least even in our patient practice, about 50% of the patients would see benefit by following this and not eating or drinking anything in no man's land in that two hours before going to sleep. Um, and then the reflux acid uh, activates esophageal chemoreceptors, which uh, stimulates the salivary glands. But you don't want to really rely on the uh, acid to come up and you know activate the saliva while just not using your gum. Another advantage for chewing gum is uh, uh, actually taking the vagus nerve to exercise, like creating some vagal stimulation, which is really one of the best things we need for the digestive uh, you know, process, the juicing. And a lot of our patients, I'm sure when you examine them, they have a higher sympathetic tone. You touch their hands, they're cold, they may be a little tachycardic, you know, so um, it just means that the vagal no, uh, nerve can use some support. To, what, what about procedures that stimulate the vagus nerve, like cough, gag reflex? Um, yeah, I mean, those are all good, and okay. there is a website now we found it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Ice water. Um. Most of you have checked it out, I like checked one time, so uh, what the stimulates the vagus nerve, and I got a website with 30 different uh, items written on it, uh, so occasionally we give that as a reference. I think the guy did a nice job putting it all together, and there are some probably electrical equipment, so we don't really have a, a personal experience with it, So, um, but I think it does exist out there. I know the vagal stimulation has been used for uh, prevention of migraine, and that uh, machine got FDA approved. Uh, we tried to look into it and see if we can get it. It was like $600 a month, you know, with or without insurance, so uh, it wasn't something you can just throw in very easy on people, okay, especially without adequate research. Uh, uh, but it may have some role, and I know that some universities have used it at this as part of the research. Um, again, just remember, saliva can, is a weak neutralizer of the acid, and is one of your best uh, uh, methods to deal with the reflux. But this also means that if the patient has uh, dryness of the mouth because of drugs or disease, you're going to be more prone to reflux, okay, because especially at night, 
when this stuff comes out and there's no more swallowing and the mouth is dry, you're gonna have more potential for damage. So obviously you wanna do everything you can to avoid dryness of the mouth. So yeah. what about just having to drink more water? In the middle of the night? No, no, I mean like That's good for my no, business. No, no, no. <laughs> More water during the day, you know, if you're standing up, I mean, it's perfectly fine. Um, we do use some alkaline water at times. If I know the patient does not have hypochlorhydria, then I do make that recommendation. There is literature to support the role of the alkaline water for that purpose. However, I do tell them do not take it with your meals. You take the alkaline water somewhere about maybe an hour before you eat or away from the meal, so you don't really interfere with the digestive uh, process, okay. Um, let's go to the uh, next slide. The tissue resistance, uh, I said, okay, if my tissue is uh, strong, you know, I have good bondage of the lining, I have less chance of either feeding the reflux or, uh, you know, the noticing damage to the tissue. And the effect would be at the pre-epithelial, epithelial, or post-epithelial factors, uh, which act together to minimize mucosal damage from the noxious gastric refluxate. So of course, how do you deal with that? Okay, until now, and I'm sure most of you have used the, uh, things like the vigorous right licorice, marshmallow extract, aloe vera. I mean, most of these, they increase mucus production, which is uh, helpful. In the esophagus, there's not a whole lot of mucus there, so it's more helpful for the stomach. But I still use these combinations. The product that they have, a combination of these natural things, they have been around for many years, and I just, you know, sometimes use it as a supportive measure. I think it does help. Uh, um, but one thing that has been quite helpful in our practice is the BPC-157, okay? And you can go to the next slide, I think we may have something on that one. Um, if you go to the next one. Uh, okay, so maybe it's coming up a little a later. But uh, the BPC-157, there's um, uh, good literature to support uh, the idea of uh, you know, supporting the tight junctions. And uh, I have them maybe open the BPC in the capsule and maybe take it with a sip of water so it would soak the esophagus in. And in some of the intractable cases, I found this to be quite helpful. Okay. Uh, go back to the next, to the previous one, please, for a moment. Uh, so, do you know uh, gastric reflux? Uh, we prepared these uh, slides rather quickly, so I did a lot of description. But what it's trying to say is that if the bite comes from uh, small bowel into the stomach, then you may also have a problem with the same thing getting into the esophagus and it may cause injury to the esophageal mucosa. The question is that why would the bile come from the small bowel into the stomach? And admittedly, the classical textbooks, they have written very little about this. And our experience is that, that uh, usually the proximal the small bowel is contaminated, either from SIBO or C4 or parasite or a combination of these. And we have numerous cases as examples that we have demonstrated this. It's not published, but uh, I was able to present this data in a previous SIBO conference. We'll have a little bit more uh, in the next up, uh, upcoming one. Uh, but if you're really interested, you can watch the video that we posted on our website. It's a one hour presentation and it has some of these concepts uh, in it. Uh, and delayed gastric emptying uh, is an interesting concept. It's part of a neuropathy. You know, somebody has vagal neuropathy, they may have delayed gastric emptying. But there's also one other phenomenon that when there is bile reflux into the stomach, it appears the stomach just doesn't want to move. Okay, as if physiologically, they say, look, your small bowel is contaminated and I don't want to put the food down there. I see a downstream problem, okay? So the whole motility slows down, but to me that's a secondary phenomenon. That means that if you fix the downstream problem and you clean up the infection that may be there, the whole motility may start to pick up again. Um, could SIBO be one of the factors by the gas pushing up and forcing open the lower esophageal sphincter? Uh, the SIBO could be a factor, and that's why we look for, you know, proximal SIBO. We look sometimes for fungal elements and also for parasites. 
I don't know if it's based on gas production. I think it's, to me, the way I see it, is more a motility issue. It just basically slows down the activity so things, they want to stay here and not move down. I don't think it's the gas pressure because you can simply just burp it up, you know, and I don't think the gas is going to accumulate to that degree to because of the, the but this, again, that's my understanding, and I could be wrong with that. Um, another very important concept is gastric accommodation. Has anybody heard of this? Okay, I mean, it's really crucial how a holistic model is going to use this concept because you can have an athlete with a very strong valve, but if the, uh, the stomach pressure is very high, it can squeeze the, the contents into the uh, esophagus and overcome the esophageal barrier and cause the same toothbrush phenomenon that I mentioned. And under stress or other conditions we don't understand, the stomach accommodation reduces. The accommodation means this, that as we eat, the stomach just becomes, it just stretches out. It's not an open box, you know, as you eat it opens up. And this expansion is actually controlled by the vagus nerve. So it's a whole neurologic, it's a very active process. You eat too fast, too much, I mean, you're not gonna give enough time for this thing to expand. And I always use an example, you know, I can't finish a happy hamburger. My son probably can finish two plates, you know, about half of the time I eat, okay. So, you know, when you're young, everything could be very flexible, like the balloon, but as we grow, you know, maybe some other things happen. And I also believe that somewhere around maybe three or four o'clock in the morning, for some reason, this stomach pressure goes significantly high, and that's why many times in the middle of the night, you may have actually nocturnal reflux leading to cough and some other you know, respiratory-related symptoms. I've seen this in the textbooks, but uh, it's not clear why would this happen right in the middle of the night. Uh, but that brings us to the issue that drinking water in the middle of the night would be really detrimental to the recovery process. It okay. would mm. be interesting uh, to see if it correlates with their sleep pattern or going in and out of deep sleep or if they're... I mean, it probably has something to do with the sleep cycles, you know, okay? Uh, and I'm really, I haven't seen anything that's quite clear to explain it to okay. you. But here is where the gastric, you see this is the valve area. Okay, this is where the fundus of the stomach is. And it's like a capacitor, it allows that, you know, as you eat this thing to expand. So the pressure does not go up, I can eat and eat and eat. And if I eat it slowly enough and this expands, the pressure in the stomach would not elevate and it would not overcome the loads of the sphincter. And that's the way baclofen works. And baclofen is an old drug, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it or not. It's had it on probably for 30 years. And it's really a muscle relaxer that orthopod used to use this, but it is now in classical textbooks of gastroenterology. Because, and this was published almost nearly 20 years ago. And I remember when I read the article, I said, wow, this is really fascinating because we have been using it for that many years in here. Now, some people say, well, I don't want to take baclofen. And what it is, baclofen works on the GABA receptor. This area of the stomach has some GABA receptors. And by stimulating it by uh, baclofen, you allow the uh, expansion to take place. And in indirectly, you drop the pressure that is on the valve. So you really support the valve. But it's really more through the fundus that is doing it. And some of our patients say, oh, I don't want to take medication. I took it that side of it. I had to come up with something, and uh, uh, we learned that L-theanine almost does the same thing. Okay? I don't have data for that, but the maximum dose for L-theanine is almost 1,200 milligrams, and so it's very easy to take one L-theanine about 30 minutes before you eat, and maybe close to bedtime, maybe you can take you know, a couple of them, maybe an hour before you go to be able to sip of water to reduce that uh, um, Basically, reduction of the gastric accommodation, you can make it more pliable and allow for expansion and drop the pressure. And for some patients, the theanine has been good. You can almost say, so I'm nervous, I can't sleep. Well, then you have every indication to do a little a trial with that. Okay. Now, occasionally people say, I have a problem with the air, so we switch them back to the medication. Okay. But that's it. You will have to go back to the gum. Okay, <laughs> everything else we know. Or yeah. what about even just taking uh, GABA, liposomal GABA? 
Yeah, no, I don't have any experience with that. Okay, indeed, uh, um, I don't know if it works or not. Okay, you know, so that would be something to think about. It, okay. um, so, GERD, you know, you know, your symptoms, you already know, heartburn, regurgitation, sore throat, difficult swallowing, lump in the throat, but bad breath is a common uh, one, and also damaged teeth. Uh, and believe it or not, uh, the reflux state of uh, the reflux of the gastric contest into the esophagus causes trismus. It causes these masseters to go into contraction. And somebody did a study years ago by putting EEG electrodes, and they noticed that these things start to fire. And so, if you see somebody with uh, teeth grinding and stuff, you may want to look into the, uh, this phenomenon of reflux as well. Atypical symptoms, headaches, sinusitis, maybe tinnitus, bad dreams, insomnia, chest pain, nocturnal sweating. I have several guys with nocturnal sweating and palpitations. Uh, think about uh, gastric after refluxes, especially if these are during the night. Uh, next one. So complications, esophagitis, bleeding, ulcers, vocal cord nodules, various esophagus we talked about cancer of the esophagus and the strictures. Okay, something you already more or less know about it. Next one, please. Then. Okay, what are we gonna do? You know, again, traditional treatment, uh, lifestyle modifications, over-the-counter over -the medications, um, again, proton pump inhibitors, acid reducers, baclofen. This is what traditionally is used. And I can tell you that if you do an endoscopy, like the gentleman we just talked about, you know, okay, and you see an esophageal ulcer, it would be, to me, bad practice not to treat them with the PPI, okay? Because we know that that's going to heal the ulcer faster than the literature is there. But the key is to get them off in two, three months so they're not going to be dependent on this. You have to do everything else that is going to follow that, okay? Next one, please, okay? And surgery, you know, obviously if everything fails, you have to fix the valve, and just for you to know, quantification and there's a links procedure and there's also endoscopic fund application now available in some centers so that these are the things to consider okay next one okay and what are we going to do from a holistic mindset okay some of it you already heard but let me go through this one by one the npo two to six hours before reclining why six hours but well, somebody studied it and I don't know how they got volunteers to do six hours of not eating before bedtime, but they demonstrated that you do better, especially if it involves the larynx. Uh, you do better if you don't eat for six hours. Okay, so it may be a nice intermittent fasting bottle you can propose to them. Okay. Eat it slowly, chew well, and chew with the front of the mouth. Why? Because you can't chew it. You know why? It creates more saliva. Okay, you don't believe it, try it, okay. Plus, if you have vegetables, okay, greens, okay, it gives more time to mix with the saliva and the oral uh, bacteria, the microbiome, mixing with the saliva, and it would releases the nitrogen from the greens, nitrogen and acid, the nitrates go to nitric, and become the precursor for nitric oxide, okay. Okay, you always say that you chew like a cow, Okay, <laughs> until you feel the effect of the NO. Okay. <laughs> um, and the stress management, uh, uh, this is something I tell my patients, you know, practice light touch because uh, it releases oxytocin and oxytocin has a pro-motility effect. It may even have some healing effect on the, uh, on the mucosa. Okay. Um, if you have patients who do Pilates and they do yoga, you need to work with them not to do it in flat position. And I have patients who come with usually respiratory symptoms and they're doing Pilates, and I would say this is good for my business. Okay, like if you go to Park City, Utah, and you're a skier, you know, obviously if you're an orthopedic doctor, it would be good for your business. Uh, so, I want to about down exercises and reverse incline, smoking cessation, you already know it. Correction of a snoring, the snoring produces much higher negative pressure in the chest, okay? So if you have a mouth device or something that opens up the airway, you'll be, this is a much easier breathing than trying to 
make a higher pressure to suck the air inside. Okay. And uh, no sleeping on the abdomen. Okay. Why? I learned it from a chiropractor. Okay. Yeah, right. It's not good for your back also. Okay. Next one. Okay. Um, uh, we talked about the mint, peppermint, uh, green tea, uh, stuff with a bottle of water, low acid diets, saturated fats, uh, roasted nuts, uh, because nuts, once they're roasted, uh, they become, uh, the fat becomes saturated, and, and so it behaves like a uh, saturated fat. So uh, you got to be careful with that. Omega-3 fatty acids, also they can become easily rancid if they have been sitting outside. And as I said a few times, I've seen people taking these things before going to bed. And obviously, spices and carbonated beverages, yeah, carbonated beverages, you should really avoid that. One thing is not here, and I think I should probably describe this. I think red wine is the greatest enemy for the reflux. Okay, so um, um, maybe great, the greatest friend for the reflux. I'm going to set it up. Uh, so uh, we usually have patients really avoid wine. It has become a sensitive issue in the practice. A lot of times, people don't like to hear that. So we have to put on a disclaimer or disclosure that we usually do recommend not drinking wine. Okay. Um, next one, please. Uh, uh, salivation, we talked about it. Uh, post prandially chewing gum. Um, the type of gum we just talked about it, usually you don't want too many colors. I don't, it's a type of gum that is fruit flavor. You don't want mint, spearmint, and, spearmint and cinnamon. Okay, I'm not sure if you have used did some you of this. Do you this gum? Yeah, I do. <laughs> I don't know the name of the company, but uh, it's on, on the online dispensary. There's some of them that we just usually uh, show back and tell you uh, how to get it. Um, but uh, it's interesting, sometimes I go to Starbucks and I get a little gum from there. And you chew the gum and almost once in my sinuses open up. You know, get almost, uh, it's so strong that uh, maybe that even that essence may have an effect on the valve or the smooth muscle web. Um, so think about fruit flavor gum and uh, nothing else as a spice with it. Yeah. Um, drugs that cause dry mouth, reduce gastric motility, or relax the road of the sphincter. We already talked about that. Okay. Uh, next one is the BPC-157. This has a cytoprotective effect there. And uh, it actually was a study for uh, gastri gastritis, gastric ulcer, and uh, alcohol-induced gastritis, and the research on this goes back to almost the 1990s. Uh, and I had such a high interest in this area, I went to Croatia and I met with Dr. Sikiric, who did the original research, and wanted to ask him, well, how did he figure out that this thing was important? And he mentioned that they found that this peptide was actually present around the ulcers, and apparently the body uses this peptide to heal the ulcers. So somehow he was able to purify this and now it is commercially available in California and some other states. So we use the BPC-157 quite frequently and I think it's quite safe uh, to use it then. If you use it for uh, esophagus, uh, you know, there are companies that they make them compounded in a lozenge format. I mean, I just tell the patient to open the capsule and mix it with it like an ounce of water. It doesn't completely dissolve. <coughs> But uh, you know, it's enough that when you take it, it will probably just soak the esophagus. You sit on it, and gradually, you know, you allow some healing here. Uh, do I have data for this? No. But we did find one article from 1990. I had to order this article to the library. And what Sikirish did was they took two strips of the esophagus, and one of them they put acid, and the other one they put acid, but they also provided BPC-157, and the one with the BPC had no damage compared to the other one. It's a limited, you know, uh, animal study, but I still found it to, to be very, very interesting there. Uh, next one, please. Uh, Are you using the BPC for the cat whole time? <laughs> yes. Yeah, That's for practice. California, yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Holtoff spoke in at one of our meetings. He's, he's in uh, El Segundo. It's called Integrated Peptides. Um, the, we talked about mucus production. I, I think you're already familiar with this. Uh, has anybody used the lion's mane? Uh, Not for that. Mm -hmm. okay, I've seen occasionally patients coming in with this. It seems to be helpful. Okay. Okay, what about L-glutamine? 
Uh, air glutamate is good to generally for gastric protection. Um, I use it as part of the uh, uh, the mixture of the DGL, aloe vera, marshmallow, and there is a product by, uh, uh, I'm sure each company has one, but uh, um, uh, it has a mixture of these things, you can use it. Uh, does Met Metagenic has one of these? Uh, I'm sorry, which one? Yeah, something, uh, yeah, yeah, that yeah. has uh, this combination. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Of all of those, or just the glucose? Well, at least most of it. Yeah, yeah. glutagenics, glutamine, and aloe, and... And it has the DGL. DGL. And then yeah. Okay, so that would be the one yeah. to uh, to use it. Yeah. And next one, please again. Um, sodium alginate is very interesting. This is actually in the textbooks. And alginate is come from brown algae, uh, from green algae. That's dangerous, okay? But from brown algae. And uh, the dentists use this for um, uh, creating models. That stuff that they use it as uh, alginate in it. Mm -hmm. So um, the key, it's not easy to find this in the US. It used to be a product called um, Gaviscon, but the Gaviscon in the US is now primarily calcium carbonate. Yeah. So some patients bought it from England and we ordered from England, but uh, it just came with a lot of sugar and colors. So I was able to find one company that has this alginate as a pure format. So, um, uh, again, if you search it, you'll find it, you can let me know. Um, but uh, we use algae in maybe one or two capsules after the dinner or you know, lunch. Uh, they anticipate they may be a problem. And uh, this would help to produce like a raft uh, on the stomach, so it makes it thicker, don't come up. Uh, so if you actually combine this with chewing gum, it may be a nice mechanism to, you know, to uh, prevent the reflux. Uh, okay. Um, Promotility agents, we put some examples for you there. Uh, we use the ginger extract, not the actual ginger, but it's a big ginger extract. And I think that the may have something similar, but uh, I use it as a, as a nighttime event to improve gastric motility and prevent uh, uh, SIBO. Uh, it may have some benefit in GERD, but honestly, I don't have a whole lot of experience in that. Uh, I think you need to rely on other elements. The ginger is itself, the motility activator. Is yeah, the motility activator would be, um, but I can tell you that when we try this with some patients, the motility activator took care of the reflux. Okay, so uh, maybe we to see more uh, patients trying it, uh, but uh, it's something to keep in mind. Occasion becomes handy. Okay. We have the candy back in VR has ginger uh -huh. root in it as well as the um, essential defense. I know, but that actually puts the patient into attack mode if they have, you know, C4, C4, you know, you know this is, it is something that's purely just as a motility. Just you know, just, you have to be able to uh, do that. Again, um, there may be, um, and I think uh, your encapsulation has something yeah. here. Um, but the ginger itself is interesting. If you try too much ginger, it's actually irritated to your stomach. I mean, I won't be able to take it. Uh, you know, ginger, on an empty stomach, take ginger, I mean, it could be a little uh, challenging if you take too much of it in here. So it may be one particular extract in the product that uh, it may be helping with here. Next one, please. Uh, um, LTN, we talked about baclofen, and this is the concept of the gastric accommodation. I think it's a very, very important, uh, you know, concept. And loss of gastric accommodation may be a manifestation of uh, a vagal um, nerve issue um, and we have six patients who have what I call functional heartburn that they have really like they have heartburn and reflux but when you check them they don't really have reflux you cannot document it by physiological studies this is something the literature now calls functional heartburn and these six of these patients had the uh, positive markers serologic markers for Lyme disease in here. Um, and this is the uh, uh, um, concept of the bile in the stomach, and we mentioned that the bile in the stomach is not normal. Can you see here the the green? Um, uh, so uh, your stomach should look like this when you go in a fasting state. You don't want to see this much bile sitting there. Okay. Uh, next one, please. Uh, okay. And this is an example of a case we had. Go to the next one. Okay. Uh, this is methane producing. This patient had uh, high methane. Uh, go to the next one. Okay. 
And this is the hydrogen showing the bile reflux, you know, all that the spice, you know, and acidity was good, but the patient was having a lot of bile reflux. That's the same patient where you saw the picture we gave. Uh, so demonstrated by, by the Heidelberg test and the endoscopy. And go to the next one. Okay. And this is, uh, I think, is another example of a um, patient with a bile in the stomach. To me, this appearance is not normal. And we hypothesize that uh, this phenomenon happens because of the proximal gut not being clean. Okay. And you notice in that particular case, there was high level of methane showed on the, on the SIBO, okay. And go to the next one, please, okay. Uh, and this is what we usually check for, parasites, fungal growth, and the C4. Um, and this is the uh, definition of the functional heartburn, we just talked about it. So in our practice, what we have been doing is to obtain duodenal aspirate and send it for PCR, and we check for fungi, parasites, the bacteria is hard to judge because still the, the concept is evolving what's actually in that area. But Dr. Pimentel also told me that they're going to tell us eventually you know, how much fungi or parasite or bacteria is really normal. Uh, I'm under the impression parasites and fungi should not be in the proximal balance, so we'll see if the, this idea is incorrect there. In cases where we have seen it, patients were quite symptomatic here. And uh, uh, again, uh, we'll see how the bacterial part will go, but I don't think presence of fungus or parasites in the normal, in the proximal bowel is a normal phenomenon. Okay. Next one. And that's it. If you don't have any questions, thank you for listening. His question is that is alcohol in general as bad as red wine? So you can create like a list and uh, make a hierarchy. Okay, so red wine would be on top, then would be white wine. Okay, then would be hard liquor at the bottom. Would be, to me, it would be the tequila. <laughs> what is that? Beer. Beer would be on top. Okay. Beer is uh, full of wheat and gluten and calories and uh, allergens. You know, okay. Call the chip man's uh, alcohol. Chip yeah. Is the uh, Heidelberg test ever been checked? What is it? The test to see if there's a Heidelberg test. What about it? Is it covered by insurance? Insurance? Mm -hmm. There's not even a CPT code uh, for Heidelberg. Okay, so one patient wanted the, uh, one patient wanted the uh, super bill. I had to find some sort of unlisted code, and I don't think she got reimbursed for it. Uh, okay. What is the cause? I mean, you can ask me later on that you know how much is. I don't want it to be on the video. It's not necessary. It's on our website. Uh, what about coffee? You know, I don't limit it that much, but there's few rules with coffee. One is that uh, uh, you don't want it to be a venti, and uh, like volume is going to be a problem. You don't want it to be too hot. You're going to create thermal injury, okay? And that's not. You don't want to add sugar to it, okay? Because you're going to make the body more acidic, and you don't want to take it on an empty stomach, okay? So I don't know how to do. It. You want to have a little six to eight ounce of coffee, and I usually do not take that joy away from the patients. I have reflux myself. And I don't think really for me the coffee. So I keep that as the last one. To me, green tea is a huge problem. Yeah. Wow. I've that if people put a little lion's mane in their coffee, they don't get the reflux. I like that. Okay. Yeah. We just talked about it. Yeah. 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 Can you repeat what you said? She said to put a lion in the coffee. <laughs> 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 The lime is made in the coffee. Yeah, I've not tried that, but uh, yeah. okay. Don't put MCT oil. Yeah. You put too much of it, it's going to behave as a saturated fat, and for the reflux, it's probably not good. It's good for constipation, but uh, for this concept, would not be good. So, if pressure on the stomach increases reflux, then obviously patients with gastric sleeve or um, or with a lap band probably going to have much higher rates of this. 
Yes, and that used to be a problem. I think now they are taking measures uh, to reduce that. Uh, I mean, I don't. I think the lab band probably has dropped significantly, yeah. but it used to be uh, a problem because you're basically creating an outflow of structures. Can you uh, talk a little bit about the uh, tobacco works uh, to reduce that uh, antrum uh, tension? Why it's not antrum, it's fundus. Uh, I'm sorry, and fundus, yeah. yeah it's, uh, I mean, for the way I understand it, it works on the GABA. And the fundus has GABA receptor, and this uh, backdrop is a GABA receptor agonist. Thank you. So then why would diazepam be such a problem? It's contraindicated. You know, would it do a similar thing? Or yeah. Another? I mean, it's not exactly the same drug. Okay. And I don't have a head-to-head -head comparison. I know the Xanax, lorazepam, diazepam, these things, they actually relax the valve. Okay. Not that maybe, maybe it has some effect on the fundus. But it, they also relax the valve. The chance of reflux increases with the benzodiazepines. Thank you. Thank you. So, when you're using something like butane or HCl, do you, is there a clinical approach to using it, or do you always test on the I mean, it's not possible to always do hydrolytic tests. Right. Mm -hmm. So, occasionally, if I suspect a hypochlorhydria, Particularly if somebody has trouble with digesting protein or they feel bloated immediately, like I eat within five minutes and people say, I wake up, I'm already bloated, I have some water, I feel bloated. I mean, those, I may give them a trial of betaine. And if you're doubtful how to take it, take them, ask them to take it right after they eat. Believe me, it still works. Within minutes, it opens up. But, and then you can ask them to switch to before, okay. Um, but occasionally you have to be careful because, as I said, we have had instances where patients actually develop ulcers. Using digestive enzymes with every meal, does that help? Without betaine? Yes. Okay, without betaine, is that right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, it can help, okay, and occasionally it may even help the reflux, maybe by improving the uh, proximal gut you know, physiology. Um, usually we do a stool elastase to see whether the pancreatic enzyme is low or if the patient is a fermenter, I may just give them some enzymes to try and there are two types of enzymes, the enzyme that they work on the macromolecules and stuff, the enzyme that they work on the, uh, I call them the small molecules, okay, the more of a brush border enzymes. And you can try and see which one it works and it's really trial and error. Sometimes patients love it and they tell you it didn't work at all. Thank you. Uh, two things. Do you have experience with Domperidone? I know it's not available in the U.S., but it is in Canada. But you can get it in the U.S. You have to go to a compounding pharmacy, okay? Okay. Yeah, I mean, it can have sometimes cardiac issues, okay? And a few patients came with it, and I did not find it really very helpful. And then you have to go from 10 to 20 milligrams. But you're using a drug that is not available, and it has some central nervous system or cardiac side effects, is not going to be my favorite one to, to try. So you know, this we have not used, and some people have maybe tried Iberogast. Yeah. I, again, I didn't really find it very helpful, so we rarely use uh, those. Uh, Last thing is a testimonial. Um, my brother is your patient, and oh, he had. Oh, he has. He. Uh, we were worried. He. Um, he just could not find any help, and he's. So he's moved up to Northern California, but he still comes down to see you. And um, I used to be the lone person in my family with functional medicine. Like my brother, please go to somebody else. He went to you, and he's doing very well. So thank, thank you, you thank so you. much. I think I know who you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, because of resemblance. And I'm good. Well, he's very good, but I just I let him know that I was here. Yeah, you can let him know that my English improved talking to him. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Really great. Is the gentleman back as a question? Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't object. If somebody says, uh, I want to try it, I said, okay, try it. And how did you feel? They said, I like it. Uh, I let them, okay, it's exactly do it. Because there's not enough data to say what to do. You have to be a little bit careful because uh, um, could it be um, 
Okay, anytime you think about vinegar, I might deal with the yeast issue or not. And uh, occasion, I would say maybe two out of ten patients, when they tried this, they said they actually did not like it. Okay, so it may be a little bit, you know, acidic for them or make them uncomfortable. So uh, the best thing to do is to do a trial and error and see what happens. If somebody says, I tried that, I feel good, I said, okay, you win. Okay. Patients who particularly uh, notice their acid reflux get worse around the time of their monthly cycle. Do you have a mechanism? Is it a hormone shift or mal motility issues? Um, I don't know if it's the stress or the progesterone fluctuations. I mean, women have so many gadgets, you know. It's, 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 Patient who said that after they drink, well, you said that the beer was at the top of the irritants. Would they drink a IPAs and they get immediate um, digestive disturbance? With the beer? Yeah, with an IPA. So they're, you know, they're more hoppy and more meaty. Do you think that it's more of a low acid thing, or if it's the yeast thing, or what? What would be causing them to have an immediate response? You mean as far as getting worse? Yeah. Well, he, they, they don't report that they have GERD. Um, but this one patient, I mean, he, he did say that he had, a, you know, every once in a while a nighttime episode of, you know, regurg. And, and, and it's really interesting because you said that it, it's frequent that it would happen at 3 in the morning, and that's when he's saying that it's happening. Right. So if, uh, having beer in the evening, okay. There are several problems with that because, first of all, beer because of its, some of the fructose content, uh, you know, it may... Uh, they are diabetic. These are diabetic type. Is there alcohol in it? Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so it probably causes the bowel to become patchulous and to create regurgitation in the middle of the night, you need two phenomena. One for the valve to relax, but you need the inter, you need that accommodation to lose for the intergastric pressure to go up. And so something is disturbing the physiology and it's very common if somebody has alcohol in the evening hours to experience this type of regurgitation at night. Okay, so that would be one of the things that I could recommend, is for them to not have. No, take the out, if they really have to drink, have them do it like about four or five o'clock in the afternoon with some meal allow about five to six hours because the two hours sip is not going to be enough. Let's say if you have a little beer, maybe a piece of chocolate or something like that. Now you have several modifiers. It takes several hours for these things to clear. The effect of, it, of an on that valve may remain for some hours. Maybe you should put lion's name in it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, what would, but, but what do you think about the instant reaction of the beer? Because he's not, he's not saying that he has GERD. I mean, he hasn't been tested for GERD. But he did tell me that that, that was a situation that happened. And this well, was he's during, regurgitating at night. This was during the day. What's that? This was during the day. He said he went to the bar. He ordered that, that beer. It was, I can't remember whether he said it was in his stomach or not. But I think he was eating. That's what I remember. And he said that he got, like, an immediate response to the IPA. So, like, right. he called it. How did you put it that it felt like soap? Like if he could feel it foaming, that it was foaming. <laughs> right, so he's probably regurgitating. I don't have all the details, but if, uh, you have to look at also the preservative they're using that bottle. Many of those are very acidic. They also affect the valve. He may have an allergy to a component of this and the body wants to get rid of it. Okay. But it sounds that he's rapidly regurgitating, which simply means he's aggravating something physiologically and uh, if the, that's the way the body communicates, you should not do that. Then. Yeah, okay. By the way, what about the role of food sensitivities with GERD? That's important. Uh, uh, at least as far as wheat and gluten sensitivity, it has been shown that it can present with reflux type symptoms. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it causes the dysbiosis or whatever, but uh, 
Um, this is in the classical books, and maybe we should have put it somewhere in the slides. It said that uh, it can um, uh, it can cause that an occasion. Generally, in intractable cases, we do comprehensive food sensitivity to see if some sort of elimination may help the patient calm down the process. You know. As part of my chiropractic practice, we do manual therapy to work on the diaphragm, and we often see benefits with patients with GERD. What do you think we might be actually doing? I don't manipulate. You have to answer that question. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So let me ask you this, and I open up that subject. Okay. Did the chiropractors study the stomach? Yeah. Okay. I mean, did they actually do like an imaging endoscopy before and after manipulation to see? something more because to me the stomach is all the way in the back the acid of your junction is on the spine how would you be able to oh, no, we, go, we, we go in from the abdomen and manually do uh, manual manipulation of the uh, diaphragm or whatever we okay do. so look oh, i've had patients who can in support of what you're saying patients who told right. me it's really helped them <coughs> Okay. I don't have anything in my books, okay. but I, I say, well, I'm so happy to hear that. That's why I'm friends with Dr. Weiss, and we come, there, we come to each other. Okay. You know, patients have given uh, feedback on that, that it has helped them. Uh, it's probably readjusting that valve somehow. Yeah, it's kind of more of an old osteopathic yeah. technique. Yeah. Maybe the spine, man, maybe the spine position, you know. Okay. Oh. Yeah, 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 the principles are in, in uh, Dr. Gopi is one of the top uh, um, osteopathic mm -hmm. um, um, So you guys probably know more about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The principles are in, in anything you do to the diaphragm because it functions as a unit. Anything you do for the diaphragm will eventually affect that um, hiatus which is formed entirely by the diaphragm, not the hiatus, it's formed by the LES, right? So if those diaphragmatic fibers can cinch up around the lower esophagus. Yeah, I maybe mean, that's exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And you can get at it from the front, you can get at it from uh, the 12 ribs where the, pleura, uh, the uh, arterial ligaments of the diaphragm tap, and those weave into the pleura. But do you know if this is published or not? Because I've never seen it, other than anecdotes. Uh, you know, you're right. The only thing worth publishing would be taking a bunch of patients and treating them in this way and seeing the results with some imaging. You're absolutely right. And we need, we need to do that. Yeah, we probably, that would be very interesting. But anecdotally, yes, the feedback is very positive. We'll have to do a study. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Could we collaborate and do a study? And of course. Okay. You and Let's talk about it. Plenty of patients. Good <laughs> One okay. I got How are you, okay? Um, do you ever use lab work with those people to approach you with a lot of them to make a decision of whether you think you can take like, the hydrochloric acid off or not? You can use antiparietal antibody and anti-intrinsic factor antibodies. Uh, if those are elevated, there's probably some autoimmune gastritis going on, and that translates to having a low stomach acid. Uh, I mean, you can check maybe a serum gastric to see if it's elevated a little bit. Uh, and that, but that's tricky because then you can see if the gastric is elevated, or have too much acid or too little acid. I mean, the bloating that comes right after eating is generally suggestive of low acid. Yeah. I'm glad that you're not getting tired, you know. <laughs> Shouldn't a presentation like this at least mention probiotics briefly? Because a lot of people... Probiotic for probi what? For GERD? You're not finding... Which you? probiotic? Well, How much? right. That whole Don't thing. take it before bedtime? Right. Okay, that's tricky because if, if somebody actually has SIBO, you may make them feel worse. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. I mean, I don't use probiotics uh, liberally in the practice. I mean, if I have a fungal clinical picture, okay, I may uh, introduce it. If they have SIBO, I will try to clean it up, and then maybe I slowly introduce some probiotics, you know, into the picture. You can always consider a soil-based probiotic, which theoretically doesn't open up until it gets into cold. I mean, interestingly, we have had one out of our five patients who tried it, they said they got more bloated. 
Okay. It's, I don't think we really understand probiotic that way, but it's okay to experiment with it. Well, thanks again. One more question and then. Okay, thank you. So I have actually two things. So I have a client who came who can have one bite of watermelon, and she said it feels like it's stuck in her chest for hours. Like, like a heart. Yeah, that's just, a, that's dysphagia. That is, you have to look for a spasm, a stricture, active esophagitis, eosinophilic esophagitis, lymphocytic esophagitis, a ring. It's, I mean, that's. It's the only food that does it. The only thing she takes. If it's cold, it may be esophageal spasm. Spasm. Okay. Yeah, because if they take it in cold, no. it may be. But that should not, watermelon should not cause dysphagia. Okay? So if it does, you have to investigate. I cannot tell you what it is. Okay. And the other thing is, I have another client who says he cannot burp. He cannot burp. He's tried, he feels the pressure, he just can't. What is that? Is it a post op patient or? Uh, no. Young guy in his 20s. So that may be actually a hypertensive neurosophageous sphincter. The pressure may be too high. Remember, I showed the pressure between 10 to 30. You may have 50, 60. You have to think about if the patient also has difficulty swallowing, it may be achalasia, it may be spasm, there may be inflammation in that area that needs to be evaluated. Thank you all for listening. Thank you.